Welcome to The Mountain Gardener with your host, Ken Lane. Gardening can be challenging, but with Ken's tips, tricks, and local advice, you'll reap huge rewards. Now welcome your host, Ken Lane. And welcome to this week's edition of The Mountain Gardener, your host, Ken Lane, here every week talking about the landscapes of northern Arizona. Oh, I have never, ever seen a June as cool as it is this year. So normally it should be in the 90s. Actually, we need it to be in the 90s. But 70, I mean, I think it was in the 50s in the evening this, this week. So just super unusual. The reason we need it to be hot, we need that heat is what draws that tropical moisture up out of Mexico and creating the monsoon pattern that we're famous for July, August, and September. And so the heat is what it takes to spark that. And so it's been really nice sleeping at night with the windows open. The gardens are just loving it. Uh, but well, we uh, the, the summer gardens in June, they really do want the heat. So I notice that my peppers, they've been struggling terribly. And then we got up to 90, what, a couple weeks ago. They started to leaf out, started to go crazy, started to, to set buds. Uh, tomatoes were growing like mad. Some plants, they don't like to be in the 50s. And these are the tropical plants. Your your vegetable garden, they don't, they prefer it to be a little hotter. Here's the other thing to really, really watch. I'm noticing this exploding in my own gardens. The bugs. Bugs will take advantage of you because the weather is so nice. So they're outside. Normally, the heat would dry them out very quickly. So now they're just cool. So they're hanging out more. So the thrip, they're getting mean. Thrip are also called no Sometimes you, they fly around. You can see them at dusk. You'll see dust kind of flying around. Those are thrip. They fly around. They, they, they're they attracted to your flowers. And so they will populate like crazy. The heat is what eliminates them. They're not a summer pest. They're a spring pest. And so I've never seen thrip as bad as they are this year. It's because it's been so cool for so long. What to do or what to look for. Uh, you'll see leaves curling up. They Sometimes if it gets bad enough, it looks like they're drying up. You'll see lots of leaf drop. Uh, this is a very small insect that actually, it's a fascinating thing, they, they actually destroy the leaf or the flower one cell at a time. They're small enough to actually look at one cell, scrape it clean, and then move to the next cell. And they, they attack a plant or a, or a shrub, trees, flowers. They attack everything uh, in mass by, by the, literally... A flower can have dozens and dozens of thrip inside of it. So your peony won't open, your daffodils won't open, your zinnias won't open. They look like someone took a Bic lighter to the end of that flower, and it looks like it got burned. Well, that's classic thrip damage, and I'm seeing more of it than ever. Or the leaves will curl, uh, and they actually curl up on or deform on your peaches, your, your apricots, your aspens, maples. It usually doesn't kill the plant. It just makes it look ugly. As soon as it gets hot, they start to force new leaves. They might drop some of those damaged leaves, but they'll force new ones. And they just go, oh, I love summer. They're your plants do. Not the, not the bug. The bug hates it. The plants love it. And so we really do need some heat. I'm enjoying it, but the bugs, I'm not liking the, the bugs. I'm spraying almost weekly. Uh, my vegetable gardens and my flowers. And so I'm spraying them with, here's what I'm really doing. I'm spraying with triple action. You organic gardeners know it as neem oil, N-E-E-M, neem oil. That's the main ingredient. Uh, Fertilone puts out triple action. It's just a really good balanced product, very easy to use. And you can spray up to the day of harvest. So I'm starting to harvest a few things. Some squash are coming off. I'm starting to see just the leading edge of of the uh, plant harvest. Some tomatoes are starting to come off the smaller ones. So I can now be comfortable in spraying that particular plant for bugs, thrip and aphids mainly. A little bit of spider might show up. And then I can go out and just rinse it off and eat it comfortably. We have been hosting a few backyard parties. And I mentioned that thrip can also bite you. 
They're also called noceums. They can leave a little welt, especially in the morning, I notice. I'm out there reading uh, my Bible or reading magazines or whatever, sipping some coffee, and and, uh, and they're biting my, my legs and my arms. I'm going, gun it. It's hard to keep a, a biblical mindset while, while b- bugs are biting you. <laughs> Anyway, uh, if, if I'm entertaining in the backyard, the, before I have everyone come over, I'll, I'll take a hose-in sprayer. So I'm going for quantity, not quality. And so I'll, I'll hose down the entire backyard, anywhere where a bug might be f- thinking about hanging out. Mainly I'm focused on noceums or thrip and flies. Those are two main things that destroy a party. I'll hose down the entire garden, especially around where the patio and the barbecue and the spas are, with multi-purpose insect spray. This is a concentrate. So bottle, this is something I make locally. Uh, it's It's as safe of a synthetic bug killer as you can get. So it's it's replicated uh, from uh, crushed mums. So it's 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 not organic, but it's sure as close as safe as you can get, and not but it's highly highly effective on flies, mosquitoes, noceums. So I'll hose down that area just to get rid of any bugs that might come into the gardens, into uh, the patio entertainment areas. That, and I'm really strong on planting certain kinds of plants around my entertainment areas. So we're all enjoying that backyard barbecue, just time with family and friends. We're starting to get together a little bit. Um, You want your backyard, I mean, one fly or ants, flies and ants, hornets, well, they just ruin a party. So they just, all the ladies just go running inside. Actually, all the guys will too, if they're bad enough. And so what I do around the patio where I've got seating areas, I've got container gardens, and I'm purposely planting things like scented geraniums. This is a natural repelling, insect repellent. Uh, just regular geraniums will do it. Marigolds will do it. Uh, but scented geraniums really do it. They get larger and they're more fragrant. They just have this great citrusy uh, f- flavor to it. But if you water them down right before the party happens, they send off the scent throughout the patio, which everyone enjoys, but the insects, it repels them away. I'll plant lavenders, rosemaries. Certain things have very strong repelling effects to insects. And so if I do those two things, I'll spray down the the outside gardens, which they're beautiful right now. Everyone comments, oh, what a great place. Well, yeah, but it also has bugs, or it did this morning, but it doesn't right now because I took care of them for you. Uh, I'll spray down those gardens with multi-purpose insect spray, uh, and I'll use a hose-in sprayer to do it. Just just hose it down real quick. Uh, And then I'll spray, not with multi-purpose. I don't want that on the patio areas. There I just have scented type of of flowering plants that re- naturally repel insects. And so I'll just spritz those down with some water. So I'll take the hose and sprayer off the hose. and I just spray down the rest of the patio, cools down the patio, gets rid of the dust, and brings out that fragrance to my scented geraniums, marigolds, uh, lavenders, rosemaries. There's several different varieties like that that, that you could still plant right now. You, you, could, you could find these things at your garden centers to help you as well. Mosquitoes will start coming out in about a month. When the monsoons do get here, they'll start coming out. It also works very well. That same approach works very, very well for mosquitoes as well. So a couple ideas, some things that I'm doing in my own gardens. Remember, my name's Ken, and we're just friends. And we're like backyard neighbors just talking over the fence. This is what's working for me. I think it will work for, for you as well, equally as well. So uh, fruit drop. I noticed, too, one last tidbit, and then I'll move on and get uh, Lisa in here with your garden questions. I had my peaches started to drop some of my fruit. Uh, plums can do this. Apricots. And they seem to take the month of June and do this. Don't worry. It's a natural thing that happens to fruit trees. They're naturally thinning themselves out so that they can put all that energy and make the few fruit, fruits that are left, they'll put all their energy into those. So we have larger types of typically pitted fruits. I noticed that started to happen on my peaches this week. So I know it's going to start happening to yours. You might see a little bit of fruit drop on your apricots, plums, nectarines, peaches, and uh, those pitted fruits. Not to worry. Uh, Kind of watch your watering. I mean, if it's dropping all the fruit, worry. But a few fruits, ah, it's fine. You need it to happen or you'll get a whole bunch of little tiny fruits 
with big pits in it. Got a lot in store for you. We'll be right back. You've been listening to The Mountain Gardener with Ken Lane, owner of Waters Garden Center in Prescott. Join him every week for timely garden advice right for the gardens. Visit Ken where he can be found throughout the week at Waters Garden Center in Prescott. Waters Garden companion plants for June are Golden Locust, Moonshine Yarrow, Hall's Honeysuckle, and Gilt Edge Silverberry. Gilded Edge Silverberry grows head high with bright gold and blue leaves that screens out the most obnoxious neighbors while standing up to blistering heat and wind. The super sweet flowers are utterly animal proof. Even javelina and deer don't like the taste of this local shrub. You'll find the best evergreen natives at Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott. Gee, my flowers just bloom too much. Said no one ever. Hi, this is Kenneth Waters. We had a crazy winter and everyone's ready for flowers in the garden. Waters Flower Power is made specifically for Arizona that gives flowers that extra boost to burst into bloom. It's an energy kick in the plants. Get ready for roses that rule, peppers that pop, and tomatoes that triumph. More power to the flowers with Flower Power at Waters Garden Center in Prescott. You've been listening to Ken Lane, the Mountain Gardener. Green thumbs learned while working in the Family Garden Center. Now welcome back to the Mountain Gardener. And we are back in the studio with Lisa Waters Lane. She comes each week with your garden questions. Just what are your neighbors talking about? So welcome to the studio, Lisa. Thank you. Yeah. So it's kind of a sad, sad week. Sad. I'm just sad. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, the kids yeah. are starting to head back home. So yeah. the economy is starting to open up. Mm-hmm. We're past the peak of the spring season, so a lot of the garden, a lot of things are, are in the ground. So mm-hmm. uh, we, we're in our summer levels, so lots of summer plants, but uh, the pressure's off. Mm-hmm. And so, and the kids, they want to go. I mean, if you've been away from your house for three months, you just start to get homesick. Oh, so yeah. our two oldest ones are going back to Austin. I know that'll be hard. It's been fun having them here. I've enjoyed every minute with it, but yeah. It ends. I, our our uh, son-in-law, he was talking to him on the sidebar. He said, "You know, we want to take we want to take every advantage we can while we're here with you all, so we can visit with you. But you know, we just need some alone time." <laughs> <laughs> but, well, it's Jeremy, that's pretty honest. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we have seen them a lot. We, we work have. with them. They usually come over for dinner, and we hang out. We watch TV and stuff. But that's a family uh, business for you. Right. So family is, especially kids, you know, white mm-hmm. husband wives, families work together and they eat together, they play together, and we just that's a family business. Right. Yeah. So yeah, it'll be sad, but life goes on. It does. We'll go and visit them. So there Austin, here we come. We watched a, a video. When was that? On Wednesday. I think that's right. They were doing an Austin City fundraiser. Oh. All the musicians were coming online, like like Garfunkel and you know Nelson and all the names, Clint Black, all the names you know, uh-huh. were raising money for the, the bars and, and, and servers and oh, restaurants okay. and you sure. know uh, that that oh, genre. Right. They raised over a half million dollars. Wow. It was amazing. Two hours. They had a live concert. Yeah. We sat down on the big screen TV and uh-huh. watched it, and they just went... <gasps> I miss Austin when we got sure. all done. So it's kind of yeah. good. Anyway. Oh, nice. Yeah. Garden questions. Garden questions. That's right. It is a gardening show, isn't it? <laughs> so Ryan is in Prescott. He says, I'm so confused about my watering. My maintenance crew sets my drip for one time a day uh, for 20 minutes. But when I talk to you guys, you say one time per week on established tree. Who's right? So uh, we are. <laughs> I mean, come on. Plants do not like what's happening is a drip system. You have to think the math. This is where you, you bookkeepers and nurses and accountants, you just, there's no numbers people, you just get it. And so you've got a one gallon per hour emitter and you're running it for 20 minutes. So how many, how many, so it's got to run for an hour to get one gallon. You run it for 20 minutes. You're just over a quart, maybe right. something like that. So you're giving your plant a quart a day. That's probably really good for a container. Or a flower bed or tomato, but it's terrible, horrible for a tree or shrub. So what you're doing is you're pushing that soil, that water will only penetrate so much. 
The more water you give it, the more it penetrates. So the goal is to push water through the entire root zone and a little bit more. Well, a quart is not even close to doing that. So what you're training your plants to do, what your landscaper has trained your plants to do is to sacrifice, to kill off, to just dry up and wither away all the lower roots, the deeper roots, the drought-hardy roots, and focus on where the water is real shallow, right above the surface, just right there at the surface kind of roots. And so those kind of plants in a windstorm that are coming, so the the, the monsoon thunderheads, that kind of stuff, have ferocious winds. You, you can see plants actually blow over, almost guaranteed. Those plants were trained to blow over. Butterfly bush, apples, peaches, you can just name them uh, where they, they just blow right over because they have, they have no roots. They don't have enough, deep enough roots. And when drought comes or the things you just can't water quite enough or you travel and the irrigation goes down and you come back and they're just dead, uh, those, those were plants that just had real shallow roots. A deeper rooted plant would just, they might look rough, but as soon as you put a little bit more nutrients and water to them, they just spruce right back up because they got a deep root system to them. So I would say that is absolutely incorrect. Uh, I would say minimum or maximum, I guess, maximum watering for an established tree or shrub. This is pine trees and shade trees and vines and flowering shrubs. Maximum would be twice a week. Really, I would encourage it once a week. And our native stuff, we hardly water at all. So the native stuff is maybe every 10, 14 days. So it just depends on how established, what kind of landscape mix you've had, what you've got. My guess is what may be happening with them, they have one valve. This is someone that right. the landscaper took a shortcut. They took one valve on, and now we've got a gardener trying to garden with a drip system that has one valve. So they've got flower, vegetable, shrubs, roses, containers and trees and shrubs all in the same one system. So what do you do with that? That's hard. And so there, what I tell folks is focus the irrigation on the trees and shrubs, water it maybe twice a week. And those things that need watering more often, let's say those container gardens out front or the flower bed out front, those things that need that show more wilting, water them and supplement that irrigation with by hand. Mm -hmm. So let the drip system take care of the big stuff, the trees and shrubs, and then hand water the, the, the smaller, more fragile things. Or put another valve in. There you go. And also, so if they're doing that one time a week watering, they need to water more than 20 minutes. Oh, yeah. Oh, they sure. Need oh, to yeah. really extend that yeah. time out. Take all that irrigation, all 20 minutes, and put it all at once in one week. So go an hour and a half. Go, go two hours. Mm -hmm. And push that water right down through the entire root zone and even deeper. And now you've got a plant that can, once you train that plant to root, to go after that water, you have a really deep-rooted plant that can ha that can take on any kind of environmental change. Okay. All right. Next question is from Melody in Prescott Valley. She wants to know, how big does the honey locust get and how far away from the house should it be planted? So golden honey locust, it's a kind of a rock star in June. It's, it's a really pretty plant. It's one of our companion plants that we suggest. They come out yellow in, in the spring, so beautiful gold color, thus golden honey locust has a honey color to it. Green's up right now, so it's starting to lose its yellow, go to go to this nice, soft, lacy green, then it, the fall color's gold. It's a locust, so it has, it has um, kind of filtered light. It's a real pretty, hardy tree, takes the wind. Uh, we have an extremely mature one here at the garden center uh, in the parking lot. Mm -hmm. You'll see a probably a 15, 20-year-old locust tree, and it's standing maybe 20 feet, maybe not quite that, mm -hmm. and about that wide, kind of a nice globe mm -hmm. shape to it. Uh, we keep it trimmed up a little bit, but not much. Uh, so I'd say 20, 25. So it's going to be at least, I'd say at least 10 feet away from the house, maybe a little bit farther if you never want to have to trim it ever. So, but, but it's pretty easy to care for. It's not noted for lifting foundations and walkways and it's not loaded for, for lifting things or causing issues. It's just a very robust wind and drought hardy kind of tree. It's perfect for the Southwest. It's a good, good tree for here. Okay. All right. Next question is from Karen. She has been spraying her ornamental pear for thrip. Oh, yeah. She's noticed uh, the new leaves are starting to come out and look nice. She wants to know, does she still need to continue to spray? So, yeah, good question. Um, uh, yes. 
until we see the weather go 90 degrees or so, so 90, as soon as we feel like summer, when you're outside spraying your plant and you're sweating, probably you don't have to do that anymore because <laughs> the thrip won't like that. Uh, keep an eye out for other insects can come out. So right now, uh, grasshoppers are starting to show up. Uh, that's bait those with no low bait. You don't spray them. Like you can't spray them. It depends on what she's spraying, but, but just keep an eye out for it. But thrip will naturally disappear about when the monsoons come the peak of the, once the summer solstice is actually here, which is like what next week. Yeah. And so th- then they seem to naturally go away. Same with aphids. They seem to naturally go away, but then there's blister beetles and the summer there's some bugs that love the heat so those will show up so keep an eye out on it but i would say spray every couple of weeks or so whatever your regiment has been keep doing that until you see that consistent 90 degree weather and then usually the thrip will go away it's encouraging she's got new growth coming out clean it's that curled leaf they love Mm -hmm. they love the taste of pears and certain certain insects are like people they got their certain flavors they love (laughs) And some they don't right. like as much. So that's how you treat for, for thrip. Lisa, thanks for being in the studio. Yep. We'll be right back after this with Ken and Lisa Lane and the Mountain Gardeners. You're listening to Ken Lane, a.k.a. the Mountain Gardener. Ken can be found throughout the week in Prescott at Waters Garden Center. Listen each week as he answers timely garden questions unique to mountain gardens. Hi, Lisa with the Plants of the Week and our Victory Pyracantha. It's impossible to kill this evergreen shrub. Your garden victory is assured. Birds will nest and revel amongst the cluster of bold red berries. Thick enough to hedge and screen, yet tall enough to use as a windbreak. A big, bold plant is just $59 and sure to impress your garden friends. Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott. For people who love victory gardens, they love to shop. As the days get longer and brighter, houseplants can struggle and scorch, but we have the solution. At Waters, we've organized our houseplants from A to Z for the brightest of sunny locations, many even bloom. With experts that know plants and how to make them grow. Shipments of the freshest houseplants in town have just arrived from A to Z and ready for a bright new home. Waters Garden Center where people who love bright green houseplants, they love to shop, found in Prescott. You've been listening to The Mountain Gardener with local expert Ken Lane. Join the conversation every week as he answers timely garden questions. Email Ken a question directly from your phone to his desktop through the web at watersgardencenter.com. That's waters with two T's, gardencenter.com. Now welcome back your host, Ken Lane. Some key garden th- tasks that I've done. I'm just putzing around the backyard, uh, just enjoying the flowers, uh, the fragrances, just just enjoying the gardens. I have a lot of new growth, which is great. We need that. It's been spring, so of course they would grow. Uh, but I'm noticing that my ewes, uh, I've got Hicks ewes that are growing over, well over one story, maybe one and a half stories tall up a, up a, a, a stucco wall, just ugly wall. But now this this you evergreen flowering you um, is taking over the whole wall is like you. But I've got this piece of art right there, and there's a door getting to the side under under the basements, and it's just it was starting to get too large, and so I gave it a haircut. I actually gave it a pretty substantial haircut, uh, and I think that's okay. I did the same thing with my patchy plume. The backyard is mainly going to be natives take care of yourself, but natives, when they're really happy and they've got, they're underneath a, a gardener's care, they can really produce tremendously and get larger than normal, flower better, stay greener, deeper, richer colors. When a gardener is taking care of a plant, they just come out and go, oh, I'm so happy that you're here. I feel good. Let me do, let me bloom more for you. Well, my Apache plume, which is a native uh, shrub up to about hip high or so, has this little white flower with these plumes to them, this little pink tassel to the end. It's just been been in bloom for a month. Uh, But now it's starting to grow and it's starting to get this leggy look or starting to get, actually, honestly, it was starting to impede on my skimmer box that I have on the pond. And I couldn't clean it out as well. I kept bumping up against this Apache plume. I went, okay, that's enough you got to get back under control. So I gave it a haircut. I gave it strategic, just got it back a little bit, maybe just a, just a trim. 
and it did great. Uh, uh, Cliff Rose, they've been in bloom for a month, another native that grows really well here. And same thing, it was starting to impede a pathway that I had. It's down a path, it's starting to grow, and I went, okay, guys, that, that's just enough. You, you, I know you're happy, and I'm here to make you happy, but uh, not that happy. Clip, and I just clipped it open so I could walk down this pathway easier. It is okay, it is actually encouraged to trim your landscape in summer. And here's what the book says. So not crazy pruning, but you can prune up to 10% of the foliage mass off any time of the year you want, especially in the summer after the spring growth. Uh, you'll want to cut back on the suckers uh, on your apple trees. Uh, they put on their fruit and they're just growing like crazy. As soon as you get done picking that fruit off your peaches or nectarines or apricots, go ahead and trim that new growth back so you can keep that plant under control. That's assuming you've got a smaller lot. If, you're, if you've got big properties, you folks in Chino Valley, Skull Valley, Paulden, you know who you are. Uh, Dewey, Humboldt, you, big properties. Go ahead and let them grow. doesn't matter. But if you're smaller and you're up against a fence line, let's say in Prescott Valley, a smaller lot in Prescott where you need to keep, you, you need it to be smaller or you just don't want that plant to get that large, you want it to stay small so that you can easily pick the fruit, then go ahead and after you've picked all that fruit off, prune back that new growth. Keep it down to size. That'll be about 10% of the foliage. That's good. You can prune it anytime you want. That's a major branch coming off of a maple or locusts or, or cottonwood. Now it's starting to impede and, and hit the roof of your truck or, or people have to duck while they're getting to your front door. Go ahead and cut that thing back. Don't let it take over the gardens. So lightly trim. It was pleasant for me because then I can go out and just spend, you know, an hour with my pruners cutting back. I always think the plants, they, they like to be trimmed and cut back. Then they'll put all the remaining energy they have. There's lots of growing season left. They'll put all that energy that they're pulling up from food and water that you're, you're, you're giving them from that drip system or the rains are coming here in a, in a few weeks. It'll put all that remaining energy into the remaining foliage mass. So you'll have a better, more handsome looking kind of plant. Uh, things like roses, prune off those old spent flowers and they'll send off new flowers. Uh, things like some of your perennials. If they get done blooming, trim them back, and they'll reset a whole other set of flowers. And so it is absolutely okay to trim on your landscape plants anytime and, and encouraged in the summer, this time of year, so before the monsoon season. What I try to do is trim things back, shape them. I'll fertilize them with the all-purpose plant food by the end of this month. And then the monsoons will come typically around July 4th. Sometime in early July, we'll get the rains. And then all of a sudden, my plants, they just go, whoa, I love the monsoon rains. I love the, sh the shaded, the clouds shading the gardens. The humidity goes up. And they just put on, it's almost like another growing season for us. They just really respond. So partly, I'm trying to keep things back under control. Partly, I'm trying to set the stage for this natural garden rhythm that we have in the mountains of Arizona. It's unique to this part of the Southwest, this monsoonal rain pattern. And the plants that you have in your landscape, they respond to that accordingly. So you might not have to do that as, as, as much in the Midwest or in the South, where it's just always growing season. Here, it's, they take a little respite in June. They've been growing like crazy. Take a little respite in June, and then they take off with new growth and the monsoons get here. That's the insider tips for this segment. We got more. Hang on. The Mountain Gardener, your source for timely garden advice right for higher elevations. Guaranteed to make a difference in your yard this season. I was raised in a nice house with my family. Now I'm out on my own and have my own apartment. I love my cute little place. But there's something I do miss. I miss my mom's garden in the backyard. It was so special because over the years I was growing up, I watched her give those flowers and plants such a personal, loving touch and so much color. I miss it so. Well, guess what? I just visited my local garden center and they gave me some great ideas. And now, because of them, when I look out my patio window, I see the beautiful planter they suggested, teeming with flowers, bright Arizona flowers. 
Looking at those flowers gives me such a nice feeling, and it's almost like being with mom in the backyard all over again. Want help with planting? It's all online at plant-something.org. Brought to you by the Arizona Nursery Association at plant-something.org. You'll love it, too. You're listening to The Mountain Gardener with local expert, Ken Lane. Mountain gardening is very rewarding, with a few of Ken's tips, tricks, and garden shortcuts sure to turn your thumbs even greener. Now welcome back to The Mountain Gardener. And we are back in the studio with Lisa Waters Lane. She comes each week just to share what's going on in her garden world, just what she's seeing while she walks the neighborhood. What are other gardeners talking about? So welcome back into the studio, Lisa. Well, thank you. So yes, I'm looking forward to spending time on the water with you, my gal. <laughs> That's true. We are going up to the lake, finally. Yep. finally yeah, fi- we have up. not been away. We've got, we share a houseboat with four other families. Four fam- own this houseboat up on Lake Powell. We store our boat up there, our runabout, and we just haven't been able to go this year because it's been so busy. Right. So before the kids take off, we just decided we are all going to go as a family up and enjoy them. Lake Powell. And so we've got a week and they're inviting their friends. So mm-hmm. it should be a fun, fun. I'm really looking forward to it. I'm sure you are. <laughs> Do you think we should take the boat up past cell phone range? So oh, I don't know if they can handle that. Could you handle that? <laughs> I know. That's the question. <laughs> oh, man. You know, Padre Bay, that kind of go mm-hmm. through the gap, and you just get – it starts to get really dicey oh, yeah. as far as cell service. I've already prompted my Google response. It says, sorry, I'm on a houseboat on Lake Powell. Uh, I will be deleting all my messages <laughs> when I get back on July, whatever, uh-huh. or June. Uh, if you if this is important, resend it this day, and it will be at the top of my pile. I've already already said, and I will do that. That's I'll just delete idea. them all. So mm-hmm. it's autoresponder. Google Mail is magic that way. I can help you too. You can. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if I can do that, but it makes <laughs> sense because I won't be able to get back to them probably. Yeah. So, yeah, but it'll be fun. We're looking forward to it. We'll hope the weather is nice and warm and not windy. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, it can be dicey. It's wind and the lake kind of go together. That is true. Yeah, we are coming up on summer solstice. Was that June 21st? 22nd, 21st? 21st? One of those two. I don't Somewhere know. Somewhere in there. Uh, Google, when is, Google, when is winter solstice? <laughs> 2020. So, yeah, it's hard to believe we're already midway through june that's crazy but june is what we always used to call the we called it perennial month is because so many of those perennials really start to shine starting in june when it starts getting really warm so it's it's what we call it perennials on parade yes that's right (laughs) yeah you gotta have something to hang your marketing hat on some sort of catchy tagline but perennials on parade yeah they just look so good they do so We've gotten in fresh loads this whole week, and we have some beautiful perennials out there that really do love the heat, love the sun, and they're just going to perform wonderful in your beds. So, Lisa, what would some of those perennials look like? (laughs) Well, we have our true and tried standby, which is Gallardia, sometimes known as Arizona Blanket Flowers, the other name it goes by. And there's two or three, actually there's a ton of varieties out there of them. But the ones that we got in, we got a red one in, which is more orange than red, but it's very, very pretty. And one that's bicolor. So the center and and the flowers toward the center are more dark brown and then it lightens up into yellow as it goes out so that one's gorgeous and then one that looks very similar to that is the rudbeckias uh, also known as the black-eyed susans yeah um so bigger flower usually than the gallardia has i think the plant itself actually might get a little bigger a little taller not mm-hmm. as full it's not a right. carpeting thing but it's more no. of a base-shaped thing but yeah it stands yeah. more like echinacea it has mm-hmm. stands what two feet tall or so yeah, right around in there very very pretty kind of almost flower reminds you of a sunflower almost that coloring but real, both of those are animal resistant so if you've got javelina bunnies that kind of thing it's got that real fuzzy leaf that they don't like so yeah. they, they leave those alone. Good wildflower. They mm-hmm. naturalize right. out in the gardens. They mm-hmm. kind of create drifts and go through. They just yeah. reseed. Very Great pretty. plants for here. 
Yeah, I think the birds like them too. They do, yeah. yeah. Well, that's a good mm-hmm. seed seed production. Right. The uh, white mountain shasta daisy, every perennial bed needs a daisy. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. <laughs> so real pretty mountain shasta daisies out there. We got some Veronica. Um, this one is the premier blue. I really like Veronica. I like the look of the flower. It has like a spiky two, three inch, maybe longer. Um, usually this one's blue, of course, but I've seen them in lavenders and pinks and just very attractive out there. Real shot of color. I was contemplating making Veronica July's uh, kind of one of, one of the companion ah. plants. You would try to mm-hmm. put a tree, a shrub, a perennial, and an annual right. together to create this is the combo in July that looks the best. Mm-hmm. I was thinking about making Veronica. Ah. The rock is so looks so good through summer. It it's just hard to beat that. It takes full blistering hot sun, blooms like crazy, mm-hmm. it's super easy to care for, comes back every year. I mean, you just can't go wrong with that. Rock gardens, I mean, just you oh, can't yeah. go wrong with that plant. Right. Veronica is such a great... Does that thing have a common name besides Veronica? I've always just called it Veronica. Veronica. That's a good... If I had, had another daughter, I would name her... Veronica. Veronica. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think we're past Let's that. Let's try for Maybe that. a dog. <laughs> yeah. We'll, we'll tell the kids, we want a granddaughter named Veronica yeah. and a grandson named Kenneth. Yeah. <laughs> That's not going to happen. can't see that going over well, but you can always ask. A uh, pincushion flower, which is another one of my favorites because it's such a continual bloomer. Uh, has that little uh, round kind of ballish shaped bloom on it. Kind of purpley to blue right in there. Great butterfly attractor if you want to bring in yeah. those butterflies and moss. Wonderful for that. Uh, but it's just a good constant bloomer. I think that's what I like so much. Low about growing. That. Just maybe mm-hmm. went ankle high. The Actually, foliage. the foliage is a few inches, but the... The flowers hover right. up to about ankle high. Yeah. It's an amazing little plant. It makes it really pretty because then you can see Does. the flowers yeah. on yeah. there. Bee balm or Monarda. Um, boy, those have bright blossoms on them. They're really, really pretty when they're in bloom. Um, there again, another good pollinator plant for here. But just a fun little plant to put in the yard. It's probably not as well known as some of the others. Yeah, but tall perennial. Mm-hmm. Gets up. Hip high or so, really tall. You think it gets that high? Well, we've grown it in Prescott Valley, and it grew that high, but it was uh-huh. in a perfect spot. You know, yeah. it's a little shade in the west, kind of. So maybe three feet instead of four feet, but yeah, I think it gets okay. easily knee high or huh. a little, bu- a little bit above. Yeah, you say so. I'll okay. You. <laughs> and of course, yarrow. Right now, we have the moonshine yarrow, which is that real bright yellow one. We actually have that in our backyard. And when you're up top on the deck looking over the backyard, boy, that just pops out at you. It is beautiful. In the moon, under the moonlight, Mm -hmm. looks good. During the day, it looks good. It just looks good. And animals, again, it's a native. So animals, they don't eat yarrows. Generally, the whites and the yellows, they don't eat. Sometimes they can get the paprikas and some of the other other colors. colors. Yeah, Yeah, so. But very, very attractive. Cat mint, of course. You always have to mention cat mint. You do. It's a great one. <laughs> it is tough. If you have a tough area where you're just like, nothing grows there, uh, cat mint would be a really good one to throw in because it is just uh, tough as nails and animal resistant. and Havelina, mm-hmm. no worries. Yeah. A pollinator starts blooming in the end of March. Mm-hmm. It's still in bloom. Right. It's amazing. Yeah. Little perennial. A blue foliage mm-hmm. with kind of a lavendery kind of flower to it that hangs up. It's just a nice little ball shaped up to about 18, 24 mm-hmm. inches. Just beautiful. Yeah, cat mint. Yeah. You can't go wrong with that. Not cat nip. Right. Cat, cat mint. mint. <laughs> and, of course, there's a lot of beautiful pinstamens out right now, um, all different colors. So there's a dark... Oh, forget the name of dark towers dark towers pinstamen has the foliage is like almost a black really color, really dark oh, burgundy to black that. and then it blooms with a light pink flower so Neat. that contrast is gorgeous um dark purple pinstamens are truly showing their glory right now hmm. definitely ones to put in agastache is another one perfect uh just beautiful right now because they love it hot and that's when they really start blooming and uh, the agastache, the other name for an agastache is hummingbird mint. Oh. Because the okay. hummingbirds absolutely love agastache. Yeah. They love to stick their little beaks into those flowers. So good one to put in if you want to bring in those hummingbirds. And, of course, salvia is great for the hummingbirds as well. They love 
they love salvia. How many salvias have you sold oh, this spring? I've lost count. Thousands. I mean, it's just uh, we had low truckloads, uh, purple ones and red lot. ones and blue yeah. ones and white ones and pink ones. It's just but a great so plant. They're so pretty. It's just such a good plant for here. So many colors now too. Yeah. And then we got a new one in called white chocolate snake root. Now that sounds like a horrible one, but it's a beautiful plant. You got to come check it out. Snake root. It sounds terrible. What color's the flower? It's white, but white. the foliage is a real dark burgundy. And it looks like a snake. No. Okay. But it's I'm going to look at that. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Lisa. So the perennials you can plant in June. We'll be right back. Look for more tips, tricks, and garden shortcuts through Ken's website. Podcast the show, read his weekly garden column, or follow him on Facebook and Instagram at watersgardencenter.com. That's waters with two T's, gardencenter.com. Waters Garden companion plants for June are golden locust, silverberry, Hall's honeysuckle, and moonshine yarrow. Moonshine yarrow is a fuss-free, heat-loving perennial with large clusters of canary yellow flowers held above a ferny foliage. It's just stunning. Mountain tough, you can't kill this perennial that only blooms better year after year. Havelina and rabbit detest the summer blooms. You'll find moonshine yarrow for a limited time at Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott. You're the area with your dream home on the inside, but surrounded by boring castle surrounded by rock is just so bland but we can help at waters we have a team of plant experts ready to dress up and decorate even the most boring of landscapes with something fresh new and evergreen plus we deliver and plant for you designer plants with the experts to help you beautify your new abode waters garden center 1815 iron springs road in prescott welcome to the mountain gardener with ken lane gardening in the mountains is different Listen to Ken's tips, tricks, and garden shortcuts guaranteed to make your gardens more beautiful than ever this year. Now for better advice that works locally, welcome your host, Ken Lane. In the Garden Center this week, we've been restocking or or had quite a few truckloads of plants come in, and we're restocking with the summer blooming plants. And so some of the stunning, I mean, just over the top uh, summer plants are uh, butterfly bush. They are, there's so many varieties to pick from, so many colors. Uh, And if you've not grown butterfly bush, it's more, it's it's truly a Southwestern kind of plant. In the Midwest, they're almost weedy. They take over, they reseed. Here, they don't do that as much. They seem to do better in a drier climate at high altitude. So they're just a natural plant for, for here in the mountains of Arizona. The beauty is animals don't eat butterfly bush. Uh, that's like deer and rabbits and javelina and all those things. They just leave them alone. They've got this very heavy textured foliage that just it's a natural defense this plant puts off to get rid of animals. Uh, but it's got this real long conical-shaped flower to it that truly does attract butterflies. So thus the name butterfly bush. The secret, your grandparents only had like two choices, there was a red and a purple. That was it. And they were huge. They would get up to 10, 12 feet tall. They were monsters. I mean, dogs, small children have been lost in the middle of butterfly bush. Uh, but we figured out how to breed smaller varieties. So now it's, plants are very much like pets. So you can like think dogs. You've got Great Danes, and they bred down to things like chihuahuas and everything in between. You can breed plants exactly the same way. So it's husbandry for plants. So there's people that just, that's their entire career, and they sit down in labs or in greenhouses filled with different kinds of cross-pollinations, and they're grafting different things together, and they come up with these new plant varieties. That's the beauty. That's the fun, actually, of gardening, and especially in my business. I get to go see a year or two early what you all will be seeing in 2022. I already sort of know what's coming. So I've already seen the test gardens and what failed, what succeeded, and so it's just really interesting stuff. And then you come to the garden center, you go, oh, look, look how pretty it is. Oh, I've never seen that before. Oh, that's so neat. That's, part, that's truly that giddy joy that, that you have as a gardener out, out in the landscape. Where was I going with this? Oh, the summer planters, summer, summer uh, bloomers, uh, the crepe myrtles. They've not quite started to bloom yet, but boy, 
are they leafing out like crazy, setting their buds. Uh, so crepe myrtle is one of the summer through fall type of blooming shrubs, fluorescent, radiant uh, type, fl- type of blooms, a color to it. Nothing's like a crepe myrtle. An interesting tidbit, uh, crepe myrtles are a very large family of plants, and there's only a few of those that can grow at high altitude. Uh, most of them will die out in the winter. But here, there are some hardy varieties that we go curate and find for you that will actually take the winter. That's a reason that you rarely, just so rarely, see a crepe myrtle tree like you would in the south. Now, according to the tag, grows fine. But if, but if we get really cold, it gets tricked into leafing out, and then, then, then it gets cold, the, the altitude just plays with some crepe myrtles. So you'll see most of them be in tree or, or shrub form. So kind of do a little research. Same thing with rows of Sharon or hibiscus. There's really only two types of hibiscus that grow here. They're all starting to bud up very heavily. Um, one is called Rose of Sharon, which is a, it, it actually is a hibiscus. You folks from Southern California, the desert, uh, H- Hawaii, Palm Springs, Tucson, Phoenix, you are, you've got that huge tropical hibiscus. That does not grow up here. It's an annual. It'll grow, but it dies out in the winter. But Rose of Sharon has the exact same kind of flower. It's a shrub, uh, but the flower is not as big as your hand. It's as big as you know, a, a baseball. But it makes up for the size by sheer quantity. I mean, it puts on hundreds of flowers, not a dozen, not, not, not just a few, but, but hundreds. Literally, the whole plant is just covered in flowers. And so it's a really hardy, robust type of hibiscus that grows here called Rose of Sharon. The second one is called um, Mashudos hibiscus. Or so you, you folks from the south, you call it Confederate Rose. I don't know why they call it that, but it doesn't look like a rose. It looks like a tropical hibiscus. So this is your what you think of as hibiscus. Huge. I mean, it's as big as your head. It's ginormous. This particular hibiscus does... It, it, it hibernates underground just like a perennial. That's why it's so tough. That's why it's so hardy. Because I'm not going to expose my, my branches to the cold. I'm going to give those things up. I'm going to hibernate underground. And already we've got a, a pink and a red, I think, here at the garden center, near at Waters. Um, they ha- they're not in flower yet, but they're growing almost. You can watch them grow per day. They'll get up. They'll grow four, five feet in one year from the ground. I mean, this is like from nothing to shrub, wonk, by the end of this month. It's, it's kind of fun to watch. And then it puts on these humongous flowers called Mashudos hibiscus. Don't ask me how to spell that. Why, why do they spell it like that? Mashudos. Probably Sir Gabriel Mashudos or something came up with this fancy new plant and he introduced it, so he named it after himself. That's actually pretty common in the plant world. They patented all that. But anyway, Mishudos hibiscus and Rose of Sharon, how I get sidetracked, rabbit holes. Um, Those are some other summer type of of blooming plants. The beauty of summer, of of planting, of shopping, of of visiting your garden center in the summer after the peak of the spring is that uh, the plants coming in are larger. They're fuller. They're in full bloom. Uh, They just, they have matured. In spring, they're just starting to come out. They've just got this tender new growth. They haven't really matured. They're just leafing. Or they were transplanted or, or what we call shifted into their or upsized into their pots. Um, we'll do that typically last fall, late summer, fall. We'll grow them out, root them out all winter. And then we'll flush them out in the spring. And then they're available for the spring growth, uh, spring sales. Well, the summer plants... We'll do the same thing, but they wake up later, and now we, we hold on to them longer, so we're trying to get rid of those spring crops, making room for the next rotation of plants here at the growing. This is the growing level. Uh, so the summer plants are typically larger, fuller, bigger plants than you could even find in the spring of the year. If you if you spotted a crepe myrtle in, in April, it'd be a twig in a bucket. It just really doesn't look like that much. But now they're three times the size because they're the same plant, but now they've flushed. They've pushed three times their growth. Now you've got this beautiful full plant. You can see what it really looks like, and it's starting to set flowers. If it's, if it's not already in flower, like a, a smoke bush, 
It's a classic mountain, southwest, drought-hardy kind of shrub. It gets up head high or so. And the top of this growth, the flower looks like smoke. Literally, it looks real wispy. It's really kind of neat. Uh, beautiful, it's beautiful when the sun is setting behind it. Uh, this plant, has it's, it's just starting to really leaf out, look full and glorious right now. Summer is the time to plant or to shop or to buy those summer plants because you can actually visualize what they look like. Whereas in spring, yeah, if you've got a speck in a potent tea or something, go ahead. It, it will grow. It's a tough little shrub down knee high or so, uh, and it will look good. But right now, they're all knee high, and they're all in full bloom. These beautiful yellow flowers uh, the size of a quarter are just gorgeous, just gorgeous. Uh, uh, honeysuckle. Yeah, it's a pretty vine in the in the fall. I mean, wisteria, pyracantha, uh, they, they look, they're nice vines. But right now, they're all in bloom. They're showing their color. You can actually smell the flowers. All of those perennial colors. I mean, this is the time to be putting perennials in because they just look so good. And you can see them right there in bloom. You can smell the fragrance. You can rub their foliage and go, oh. That's the fragrance I remember as growing up as a kid at grandma's house or whatever. So coneflowers cone, or, or gallardia or um, echinacea. These are all perennials that, yeah, they look okay in the spring. But boy, they're rock stars right now. And so you're seeing this whole rotation of different kinds of plants, the summer rock stars. It's hard to find a lilac right now. Yeah, they've been in bloom. They're spring bloomers. I sold hundreds of them, literally. And now I've got maybe a dozen. And there's maybe two varieties. Uh, so you have less choices. I'll have some, but you have more choices in the spring. Same thing with summer plants in the spring. I had a few crepe myrtles, but now I have a lot of them. Because now's the time for them to shine. So that's the rotation you'll see at the garden centers in, in your town or neighborhood. You're listening to local garden expert Ken Lane, the owner of Waters Garden Center. He can be found throughout the week at Waters Garden Center, located in Prescott at 1815 Iron Springs Road. Thanks for tuning in to The Mountain Gardener. Waters Garden companion plants for June are Moonshine Yarrow, Silverberry, Hall's Honeysuckle, and Sunburst Locust. Sunburst Locust cheerfully shouts, Hello Spring! with its glowing yellow leaves. As summer heats up, it settles down to a naturally cool green, only to turn gold again in the autumn. This water's exclusive casts a dappled shade, perfect for reading books or sharing an outdoor meal, and impervious to deer. You'll find the coolest trees here at Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott. Gardening and you don't know where to start? Waters In-Home Garden Service comes to you and identifies what you have and how to make it better. Design advice, water strategies, vegetable and flower gardens, soil and food needs, and problem solving. Always problem solving. You'll instantly be a better gardener. All for just $200 of expert time with a coupon to fill your garden dreams without ever leaving home. In-home garden consultations from Waters Garden Center. We can be at your home this week. You've tuned in to The Mountain Gardener with local garden expert Ken Lane. Join him each week as he answers timely garden questions that are sure to make a difference in your gardens. Now welcome your host, Ken Lane. Now, each month, I create a companion plant, a grouping of plants, a tree, a shrub, a perennial, and an annual. I try to do four things, maybe a vine. There can be four to five plants that just really work well together in that month. That's when they that's when they bloom. That's when they really are rock stars in the landscape. And so for the month of June, there's a whole series of plants that are just stunning and they're all showing off right now. So last week we featured the Sunburst Golden Locust or Honey Locust. This is a gold tree, a nice lacy, airy. I mean you just want to sip a glass of tea underneath it. It's just a wonderful shade tree. 30 by about 20 foot size, perfect shade tree size, and it takes the wind drought hardy. A companion to that, that's a perennial, is moonshine yarrow. This is a perennial. It grows up about, oh, a foot high, and it is right now covered. I mean, absolutely covered. There's way more flowers than there is foliage. Uh, yellow flowers, canary yellow. Beautiful, and it just keeps coming up over and over and over. Year. Every year it comes up bigger and better. The vine for the month of June is Hall's Honeysuckle, or Japanese Honeysuckle. 
this is the honeysuckle that you grew up with as a kid. It's this nice evergreen type of uh, vine. It can be a ground cover, but also grows up fences, lattices. You can train it to do just about anything you want. We, we train it to go over walls and hold down uh, you know, washes, that kind of stuff. Animals don't eat it. It's a great little, it's got a yellow and white flower to it, very fragrant. It's just a great vine for here. It adapts really, really well. Full sun, blistering hot. Portulaca. Unfortunately, I mentioned a portulaca. I'm now, I'm, on, I, I'm out of them. We're trying to find more, but portulaca is one of those, uh, it's just, it went It went the route of toilet paper. Uh, the, the, the crop just ran out. There was this run on it, and I just, once once plants are gone, it's hard to plug more to get them rooted out enough for that season to bring them in fast enough. So I think we found some that are coming in shortly. But portulac is an annual flower. It looks like, or, or moss rose is the common name for that. It's got this uh, kind of a size of a quarter, maybe silver dollar type of flower. And it looks like a succulent. This is cactusy looking flower to it. It's a really great annual for, for containers, raised beds. And then a bonus one. I always put a bonus just so I've got some options in case I run out of, like Portulaca, I can supplement this one. So Gilt Edge Silverberry. This is the shrub you want, evergreen shrub that's a native. It grows wild here. It's got a gold leaf, gold edge to it or variegation to it. Wonderfully fragrant flower to it. Uh, The reason I like Silverberry, the reason I plant it myself over, let's say, Cotoneaster, which is this ginormous shrub. It just gets huge, 10 by 10 by 10. It grows so aggressive. Or, or red tip photinia. That's this, those are all companions to each other. Red tip photinia is high maintenance, high water, high disease. Deer eat it. Everything bothers it. Uh, gilded edge silverberry. Deer don't bother. It goes up to head high. gets a thick hedge. Low water. Get it up to size and then never water it again. I mean, it's just the plant to grow here. Those are the companion plants. And I've been featuring those on our Facebook and Instagram pages, YouTube channels. If you're part of our newsletter, once a week, I just float through and go, here's the plant of the week, this week, for the month of June, and it features the companion plants. If you're not part of that, or if that's of interest at all, what looks good in June, what looks good in July, every month of the year, we do something to feature those plants that go well together in your yard in the mountains of Arizona. Uh, sign up for the newsletter. It's on our website. Follow us on YouTube. Follow us on Facebook, you know, like Instagram. We try to feature that across the boards. And, and so you can you can capture that and see it. What's going on in the gardens uh, right there on your phone or your tablet. Ken and Lisa Lane, we are here at Waters Garden Center throughout the week. And we love talking to fans of the show. Waters Garden Companion Plants for June are Sunburst Locust, Moonshine Yarrow, Silverberry, and Hall's Honeysuckle. Ideal at growing up fences, walls, or as a ground cover. Wind, drought, deer, javelina are no problem. Hall's Honeysuckle is an outstanding mountain vine with fragrant yellow flowers that loves blooming in the summer heat. An excellent solution for a fast-growing screen, even in the poorest of soil. You'll only find the hardiest vines at Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott. If you want a more fruitful garden, increase success in your landscape that just feels better, then tune in every week to The Mountain Gardener. Years of tips, tricks, and garden shortcuts are guaranteed to make your gardens nicer than ever. Listen to this podcast or read Ken's weekly garden column by visiting watersgardencenter.com. That's waters with two T's, gardencenter.com. Thanks for tuning in.